what is local is global and what is global yes. is local. We started to have the, one of the greatest mental health crises of our time. The pandemic forced people to go out of their typical box of thinking. A lot of people in the Hispanic community actually thought even discussing cancer can bring death to your door. Nobody deserves cancer for any behavior choices. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you again to a new interview of Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis interview series. Today, my guest is Alik Topalian from University of Cincinnati. Alik, nice to have you with us. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation. And uh, I'm sure that uh, will be an interesting discussion regarding cancer within and let's say outside communities. Yeah. Uh, for the beginning, I will um, ask you to share for our audience um, your experience as two-time yeah. cancer survivors. <laughs> and um, what I'm interested in is uh, if these two journeys, to put it this way, was the same or were different or what was the experience uh, more on the second journey yeah. of survivorship? So um, I was diagnosed for the first time actually when I was four years old. So um, I'm a childhood cancer survivor. I was diagnosed for the first time in 1998. Um, we've come a lot way in uh, a long way in treatment since then. Um, I remember parts of the first diagnosis, um, which I, I know it sounds kind of crazy because I was so young. Um, but the things I remember the most are trying to find a bone marrow match. Um, we weren't able to find one for me. Um, being 100% Armenian, I was told that my most likely match would be within the Armenian community. So we held uh, drives actually in internationally. Um, we weren't able to find a match for me, but we were able to help found the Armenian Bone Marrow Donor Registry. Um, so I've been involved with that since I was very, very young. Um, I always say I don't really remember growing up uh, before cancer. Um, it's kind of something that's always been in my life. And I knew I wanted to go into the healthcare field because of that. Um, I started with my bachelor's in psychology, um, and I went for my master's in public health. I had every intention originally of going to be a clinical psychologist, um, and I started working in a psychiatry department here in Cincinnati, um, and I was also working on a community-engaged research project in another role that I had as an internship. Um, I started realizing that I didn't necessarily like the clinical side of things as much as I like these community-based interventions. Um, with the individual side of it, uh, I just realized that I kind of had this skill set where I really love building different kinds of programming and figuring out how we can evaluate it. And one of the core things that was kind of underlying in my work was always social connection. So I decided to go for my PhD in health promotion and education. Um, and I focused a lot on mental and behavioral health. And I looked at re religiosity and um, neighborhood factors and social uh, uh, relationships in those settings. And if they they help to protect against um, different mental health issues like depression or anxiety. Um, shortly after finishing my PhD in 2020, um, I started feeling really sick and I actually ended up relapsing with AML. So acute myeloid leukemia was my diagnosis both times. And I was the first person to actually relapse with AML after 22 years. Before me, they didn't know it was possible. Um, just finishing my PhD um, and coming from this research background, I feel like really empowered me as a patient in shared decision making. Um, I was very involved in choosing all of the treatment protocols, looking at different clinical trials um, in a way that I don't think a lot of people are able to just because they don't have that kind of healthcare background and training. Um, and through that experience, I was treated on the pediatric side. 
Now, on the pediatric side, they wrap you in support. So I had um, horticulture therapy, music therapy, art therapy, um, different kinds of exercise classes, um, therapy dog that would come around and visit. Um, I also started to get involved in kind of more uh, social programming. So going to Um, different groups for adolescents and young adult cancer survivors. And um, I was seeing people do just such innovative things where you bring together a group of survivors and you work on, say, an art project and you all are talking to one another and it's a healing experience. And I knew when I was in treatment that I wanted to try all of the things that were available to me, because when I was done, I wanted to go back and this is what I wanted to research. Um, it was kind of like a perfect segue of, um, you know, my prior experience working in the mental health field and always trying to come up with innovative interventions for things, but now taking that and doing it in the cancer population where it's really so important. So when I went back to work, I actually switched from the psychiatry department over to the cancer center. And I got hired on as a researcher in survivorship and supportive services. Um, so anything that falls into patient programming, patient education, but also things that we offer like oncology primary care, our cancer-related cognitive impairment clinic, um, our cancer exercise clinic. I evaluate all of the metrics and things for that as well, because it's the most important to show that these things work. People want measures. Otherwise, um, you know, how are we going to prove how valuable they are? So that's kind of where I've entered into the field and decided, you know, I think this is where I want to be and highlight these specific areas of need. Uh, since uh, I'm doing this uh, interview series, as you mentioned, I noticed that um, in my case, the specialists uh, have also something to say, except yes. their uh, researchers and uh, everyone has an opinion and everyone have, uh, uh, has this intention to be involved yes. in growing up. Uh, the communities, especially the communities with lack of access to exactly. cancer care. And uh, from my personal opinion, I always stated that uh, what is local is global and what is global yes. is local. And um, <clears throat> I would like to ask you if you agree with <laughs> this statement that uh, recent events starting with 2020 with the pandemic and the crisis now with uh, all the conflicts around the world, put uh, humanity to, to a real test of social cohesion, yeah. uh, starting from the lowest uh, level, the one of communities. Do you agree mm -hmm. with this? Definitely. And I think, you know, just even the level of isolation that people had to live in for such a long period of time. And, you know, something I said uh, to my husband was, I think for the first time, the general community is starting to understand how cancer patients feel. Because so often when patients are in treatment, I know, especially for blood cancers, you get severely immunocompromised. Um, for me, like I wasn't really allowed to be around anyone. I was barely even allowed to have people touch me. And um, I think that in itself is so incredibly isolating. And basically the whole world uh, got to see that on a global scale and experience it. You know, we found that there's studies that have come out that have said uh, social isolation is similar to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, we know it's bad for your cardiovascular health. We know it's bad for your mental health. We know it increases um, your risk of mortality. So um, while, you know, the world was getting forced into isolation, um, you know, we started to have the, one of the greatest mental health crises of our time. Um, and, you know, I think we're still seeing the effects of that today. But I also think that, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that that's what individuals impacted by cancer and their families 
often have to live in that state for long periods of time of still masking in your house, even before COVID, you know, after COVID, making sure that you don't um, have any kinds of like viruses or molds or fungi because your immune system so compromised, it can't even fight off the smallest things. You know, if you're not allowed to go outside barefoot and put your feet in dirt, um, you really should not be interacting with that many people. So I think it really highlighted also some of these major concerns that we see in our patient population and brought mental health kind of to the forefront in a way that we didn't see before COVID-19. Um, remaining at the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and this uh, two years period of isolation that you mentioned, um, how do you see that um, community change or cancer community change? How difficult it was to, to keep up with patients, with uh, relatives, with uh, Uh, let's say, um, caregivers during these times. Uh, And, you know, I think it's interesting, too. So I was treated during like I was diagnosed March of 2021. Um, so I was really being treated in the heart of the pandemic. And, you know, how visitor lists were structured when you were in the hospital was incredibly strict. Um, you were only supposed to have two visitors. Um, I know that that was really hard for a lot of families not being able to have that kind of connection even with each other. Um, I know that certain times during the pandemic, you weren't even allowed to have anybody with you when you went in for your cancer treatment. Um, and I'm incredibly blessed. I always had someone with me, but so many people had to go in and face that alone. Um, which is really difficult. But something that I've seen that's come out of it, and, you know, it's changed cancer as we know it, but it's kind of changed our world as we know it, is this beauty of video conferencing and being able to do things, you know, halfway across the world from one another um, and still being able to build communities. So a lot of like cancer support organizations, um, like my mom is CEO of a cancer support organization in Cleveland. And when they switched a lot of their programming to being virtual, they actually expanded their reach. Now they have people who attend their programming actually from all over the world instead of just from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, another thing is, you know, when you're in treatment and you're immunocompromised, sometimes you're also having mobility issues or you're having a really bad day with side effects and you might not want to leave your house. And this makes it so that psychosocial programming can come to you. Um, really for the first time ever. And I know some people don't like the video as much. Um, a lot of these organizations also offer things in person. Um, but some areas have nothing uh, in person. And this can at least bring something to those people who otherwise would have zero access to this kind of supportive care. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, there's an organization that I work with. It's called Cactus Cancer Society. Um, they focus on adolescent and young adult survivors. And they have gotten so innovative. They started doing Lego building where they will send you a Lego kit to your house. And on video for a couple of weeks, you go through together and you assemble it in a group of survivors where you keep seeing the same people every week and you're building up these relationships And, you know, I think that's just so creative. And I think, you know, while it was very difficult for us, it also, the pandemic forced people to go out of their typical box of thinking um, and how to try to increase access to some of these kinds of services. It, it was also like a test for, exactly. for patients and also for uh, every specialist because um, talking with uh, uh, clinicians, uh, with oncological doctors, with uh, person in charge, with support group yeah. of cancer patients, uh, they said that, okay, online and telehealth or e-health or whatever, it's good, but uh, every one of them said that the thing is missing is that human touch. Yes. Or 
to be next to a human person because this is the most important thing yeah. in cancer treatment, in cancer so care. True. As you mentioned, to have some someone near to you with whom you can share a thought or a feeling yeah. or yeah. Uh, during this time and uh, with all uh, your experience, you become a, a voice within, let's say, cancer community. Uh, I would uh, like to ask you how hard it was for you to, to become a valued voice in the <laughs> community because uh, there are many, let's say, voices, uh, but not, not all, all of them are, uh, let's say, um, um, not verified, but able to talk about uh, certain subjects. Yeah, I think that um, I, for one, am on kind of the lucky end of this. Um, going through cancer, I think it really changed my personality in the way of it eliminated so much fear, anxiety, um, imposter syndrome coming straight out of my PhD. I had horrible imposter syndrome. Um, but going through this, um, of course, I'm an expert. How much more of an expert can you be than if you've lived through this experience, right? You have that first hand account. And then also having the background of um, a researcher. So being able to go in and apply things that way. Um, but where I kind of hit the trifecta that I think really started to make this all take off was getting involved in advocacy as well. So um, I also am a patient advocate um, where I do local and national policy advocacy um, for things that are, uh, you know, they also support my research in the future, like increases in research funding, but they also support patients, like making sure that certain testing is covered for patients. I think through that is when I started to find my voice um, and learn that I could tell my story in a way that was compelling and people were listening. Um, and then I went to, uh, so I said when I came back to work, I was still in psychiatry. I had been out of work for a year. And when I came back, I went to the cancer center and I said, you know, I want to do this work. You don't have anybody who's doing it right now. I want to be that person. And, you know, at first they were kind of hesitant, but someone had asked me to give an pr advocacy presentation at a conference. And I was up there, I was using my slides that said my institution. And um, someone from my institution, one of the leaders was actually in the audience and he came up to me after and he's like, who are you and why don't we know you? And that was kind of the impetus. And so I was very lucky that the team that I got added to is incredibly mission driven. My boss is such an incredibly supportive mentor. Almost every person on my team is either um, a cancer survivor or a caregiver. Um, so like that kind of mission focus, I think has made it a little bit easier for me. We also have philanthropic funds that have helped me be able to attend conferences um, that a lot of early career academics aren't necessarily able to attend. And so for that, I'm incredibly privileged. But <laughs> being on the side of this where it's survivorship and supportive services is hard. We're not running clinical trials. We're not doing biological drug development. You know, I'm not doing mouse modeling. I'm working with quality of life. I'm working with patient experience. And a lot of times people don't necessarily take this area of the field as seriously as they do more basic research areas of the field. Um, I think that that has been frustrating and hard um, definitely to navigate, but I think another thing that kind of helps with it is my personality and my ability to share my story. 
Um, I always say that I, when I am sharing my story, I also um, share stories of other advocates I've met along the way who aren't comfortable necessarily sharing their story with others, but their voices also deserve to be heard. So making sure that we highlight people and bring others up with us to really show how important this is, because just because you survive your cancer, that's only the first step. It leaves you with late and long term effects you're going to have to deal with the rest of your life. It gives you cellular aging. I'm 31 years old and have the cellular aging, according to research, of a 50 something year old. Um, you know, we ha we're having people live longer than they ever have before after a cancer diagnosis. And we need to figure out how we take care of them during that time as well. It doesn't just stop because you uh, are in remission. Uh, and also your enthusiasm in uh, yeah. talking and uh, Thank you. your activities, uh, because unfortunately, the cancer experience is something that uh, you live on a uh, long, long time. Uh, exactly. Talking about communities and uh, you as a voice from or within communities, uh, it comes in mind to uh, notion, let's say, that each community faces. First is stigma in cancer care, including self-stigma. And the second one is inequality in cancer care access. Uh, what is the case from your communities, to put it like, like this, or with the communities you work with yeah. regarding stigma and inequality in access in cancer care? You know, it's it's so interesting, these two issues, because there's so many things that can go into it. Um, you know, there's the stigma of stigmatized cancers. So a lot of people talk about head and neck cancer um, or lung cancer, where people think that, uh, oh, you you had a negative behavior. So that's why this happened to you. And that is absolutely horrible in the communities that it affects. And we've actually seen like male head and neck cancer patients have some of the worst mental health outcomes of any cancer patients. And I believe a huge part of that is because of this stigma, um, you know, and also when you look at different cultural groups. So I've been working with an organization lately. They were translating their resources from English into Spanish and the direct translation wasn't working. Um, and they wanted to figure out why. They did focus groups and interviews. Um, and one of the things that kept coming out was the stigma. So a lot of people in the Hispanic community actually thought even discussing cancer can bring death to your door um that people there's some cultures where people even think that you're contagious still if you have cancer and that can be incredibly stigmatizing um there's the stigma of not wanting to reach out for help and not wanting to be a burden to the people around you and you know i think that all of these kind of go together in separate issues that need the proper like cultural tailoring to address it's not gonna be a one-size-fits-all approach to try to eliminate these stigmas um i think you know i had such a moving conversation once with um she was a five-time lung cancer survivor and um she uh used to smoke and she you know, broke down and said, you know, I don't even feel like I can cry because everybody just thinks I deserve this. But nobody deserves that. Nobody deserves cancer for any behavior choices. That's not right. And that's not how it should be. This is what um, we call self-stigma. Exactly. I deserve this, uh, I this uh, yeah. This is it's so difficult. And, you know, that's where support and... Um, you know, counseling, but also, you know, talking to others with your diagnosis can be helpful to kind of come together and see, um, you know, help each other overcome some of those stigmas. Because 
uh, you're always your own worst critic. You're always going to be harsher on yourself than anybody ever would be with you. So sometimes getting some of that outside opinion is important. Now, when it comes to equity and access, that's another huge issue. So I've been working on a couple of different projects kind of in this area, and we see so many different inequities. You know, we often hear about it as racial disparities. One project I've been working on, um, it's we did a pilot and we found that a lot of our African-American men who were diagnosed with lung cancer were declining undergoing lung cancer treatment or surgery um, because of things related to social determinants of health. So um, transportation, housing and food insecurity, but also provider trust and communication. And that played a huge role into it. So we've been working on building some interventions with patient navigation um, to try to help with some of those things that we're seeing. Um, equity in terms of your location. We know so many of our people in more rural areas don't have access to any supportive services, sometimes even a cancer hospital. I know there's counties within our catchment area here in Cincinnati that are two and a half hours to get to the hospital. Um, that in itself poses a great deal of inequities. Um, another thing that we've seen though is, um, I know it's a population I keep talking about, but the AYA, this adolescent young adult group, um, we are a huge cancer disparity, you know, 18 to 39. What we see in this population is usually later stage diagnosis because they're misdiagnosed so many times because everybody thinks, oh, they're too young for cancer. It couldn't be cancer. Um, and so because of the social developmental stage in life you're in during that age range, there's also a lot of, you know, tailoring that's needed to address some of those concerns. People are just starting their families. They're just starting school or their first job. They may be uninsured or underinsured. Um, and, you know, that's a huge equity issue that we see as well that sometimes doesn't get as much focus as some of the typical disparities that we discuss. But age counts as well. Um, and I think it's also something that is going to need cultural tailoring. Both of these things, you know, being a community engaged researcher, one of the things that I believe is we're doing things with the community, not for the community. We don't want to go in and say, hi, here's all these things that we're going to start implementing in your community. And this is going to be great and help you. But we don't have any input from that community itself. You don't know if that's actually going to work. That's just coming from your brain and trying to put it into another environment. You need to have things like co-design. You need to have things where you have individuals from the communities you're trying to serve involved from the very beginning and making sure that your priorities are even right to begin with. Um, and I think that's going to be something that's really important to address both of these key issues. And to inspire hope. Exactly. Which, which is the most important thing, to inspire hope and to give uh, hope that there is time for yep. every cancer patient. Exactly. Uh, we don't have uh, too much time left. And uh, I would like to ask you like uh, the last questions briefly. Uh, usually I ask my invitates about hope in cancer care, but this time I would like to ask you being a voice within communities, how important is trust in providing cancer care? I think it's incredibly important. Um, and, uh, you know, I, my first doctor, the one who diagnosed me, um, actually had told me August of 2020 that I was so far out from treatment, there were, I was cured. There was no chance of my cancer ever coming back. And then that doctor was the same person who had to give me my diagnosis in March of 21 when I found out.
And I did not trust her at all anymore because I, I thought the whole thing was so backwards and mind boggling to me. And then I went um, home to Cleveland. That's where my family is. And that's where I was treated. And I met my primary oncologist immediately. And I, she just brought this calming presence into the room. And I just knew I knew that she would save my life. And I don't know how to describe that, but I was like, I don't want anyone else. I want her. And uh, because it was the PED side, I also had to have an adult oncologist consult. And I initially didn't necessarily have that same relationship with the adult oncologist. Um, you know, there was even a clinical trial I was approached for where I would have had to switch over to the adult side 100%. And my doctor who I liked would have only been the consulting doctor instead. And a huge reason I didn't participate was because I was like, no, this is my doctor. And, you know, I, I trust her with my life, literally. Um, and I think that's so important because, you know, this isn't just the cold or flu. Um, this is something that you're going to be going through long, intensive treatments that are going to hurt physically, mentally, spiritually. And you want to make sure you have a partner who's fighting beside you. And, um, I think that that's so important, even in, you know, follow-up care. Um, I live in Toledo now. My husband's in medical school, but my primary care physician's in Cincinnati, where I work. Um, and I started trying to find primary care physicians where I lived now. And uh, it just didn't seem like any of them were necessarily understanding um, what I needed as someone who was still immunocompromised, who was on maintenance therapy and needed extra attention still um, because I get sick more often and those kinds of things. And, you know, even finding that has been so difficult. Um, I always say, uh, you know, you're interviewing your doctor just as much as like they're looking at you and you don't have to stay with the first doctor you meet if you don't think that they're the right fit for you. Okay. Alec, like thank you very much for sharing with us this wonderful information, news and activity that uh, you are doing. Uh, I wish you good luck in your further activities and future uh, events and workshops that you are preparing. And uh, thank you and uh, have a wonderful uh, afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so great meeting you and I really want to hear more about your work too. So I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you very much. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.